Insofar as it symbolizes the whole of time, Caesura creates the possibility of a temporal series, before and after, before the Caesura, after the Caesura. For to lose all is repetition in this series, past, present, and future alike, three repetitions. The past does not repeat as equal magnitudes, except by analogy or similarity, but as acts always, quote, unequal to the act uh, they imagine, unquote. Deleuze gives the examples of Oedipus and Hamlet. Whether the act occurs in the actual past or the future does not matter. It is the form of the act, its imagination as unequal to itself, itself that ties it to the past. The present, which relates to the caesura, is the actualization of the act. It is repetition as metamorphosis, as a becoming equal of the imagined act. The repetition of the present as metamorphosis, however, harbors a secret complicity with the act it actu with the past that it actualizes, and that is the I whose action becomes equal to itself. The third synthesis destroys this complicity. It shatters the I and repeats the act as eternal return, as repetition of the new. The caesura draws together the past and future and actualizes difference, the new, in the present. In Deleuze's view, this is how time passes, as for Nietzsche, as eternal return. Repetition is pure, intensive difference and not as imagined creation of the eye. In other words, the dice throw. Repetition of intensive differences generates rhythms. All rhythms repeat unequal emphases. In music, for instance, there is the repetition of accents, attacks, accelerations and decelerations, rests, silences. Time is rhythmic only insofar as the caesura creates the possibility of a series and distributes intensive differences repetitively. There is a very close relation between intensive differences, which are pure magnitudes, and affects, which are concrete powers of existing and acting. Affects are intensive differences that are generated in encounters, that is, within different kinds of assemblages. Encounters, you and I hear, for example, collective improvisations, for instance, are rhythmic distributions of affect. We say a good encounter is one whose rhythm is not simply intense, but one that increases our power of existing and acting, and that enables an encounter to persist. A bad encounter, on the other hand, is one that decreases our power of acting and existing until the encounter fails or dies out. Like Nietzsche, good and bad are not moral terms here, but categories of power and persistence. So, let's call a good rhythm uh, a powerful rhythm, a groove, uh, borrowing a musical term for a rhythm that powers up a collective activity, such as would occur in many kinds of ensemble work. It's cliched, but we say when time happens, it grooves. I'm really uh, dating myself here. Um, all this means is that the intensity increases. But it also means that a new dynamic persists. When, when the collective improvisation hits a groove, time passes for it as a whole. A powerful rhythm draws together all the diverse lines and makes them resonate. A groove is this resonance when collective time becomes effortless. This, I think, is a good definition of power, uh, for time to become effortless. If you think of how difficult it is for most artists to make uh, what requires so much work and practice effortless, this is the power of art. What are the conditions of resonance? A groove always comes from the outside, from outside the current dynamic. Let's say it's, let's call it the imminent outside in the sense that it already exists potentially on the inside that is, inside the passing event. You don't have to search for a groove. It finds you. You don't have to listen for it. It forces you to hear. A groove starts a new common perception. It generates common ideas and sensations, a collective kinesthetic that draws together bodies and forces. Grooves are resonant 
but they emerge from a dissonant or an arrhythmic condition that paradoxically generates new resonant forms, and this is the caesura. Caesuras continually undo and recreate the ryth rhythmic resonances of the ensemble. A groove is a kind of ex excess or ecstasy. It captivates and frees everyone at the same time. As it fractures the eye, it simultaneously powers up the collective's temporal existence. This is the effective quality of a group, its joy and its exuberance. Groups are not personal matters, they are impersonal multiplicities. They are not bound to a particular content. In fact, anything, any content that breaks time can serve as the onset of a group. Groups are also not styles, uh, but rather molecular becomings. To be clear, so-called rhythmic styles, which are reproduced in soul, are not grooves, but figures of control and modulation. When grooves are modulations, they no longer really group, but become repetitions of equalities. Societies usually have an interest in controlling grooves because they are both profitable and dangerous to social order. Crowd control is an example, but also uh, certain kinds of uh, musics. Uh, uh, musical styles are dangerous and problem. No social power, however, really controls grooves. Grooves are passive actualizations of power. They are spontaneous and emerge even in the most actively and tightly controlled environments. Any rhythm is a potential groove, but actual grooves are rare, in philosophy as much as music. In the genealogy of morals, Nietzsche, descending into nihilism, cries out, bad air, bad air. Nietzsche's nihilism is not just an abstract philosophy, but philosophy that literally can't breathe. Fresh air is power in life. If you can't breathe, you die. <coughs> Breathing has a rhythm, but it doesn't always groove. Everyone who has experienced the joys and sorrows of breathing when breathing is effortless and when it is a struggle. The ability to cross the threshold between breathing in and out is everything. Those thresholds, as they are crossed, are the rhythm of breathing. When that rhythm becomes effortless, that's a groove. And a groove is a power of becoming and persisting. Societies of control make sure for us that time is not effortless, but that effort is the whole of time. But effortless time is a break, the onset of a group. It is the actualization of an effective potential. Easy laughter is a good example of a breathing group. Effortless laughter is power and is also the heart and lungs of Nietzsche's philosophy. The effective potential of any encounter, then, lay in its rhythms. Effective potential, according to Spinoza, drawing on Spinoza, is actualized in an encounter's persistence. Only certain rhythmic encounters have power in this way. Play rhythms sometimes develop grooves. Work rhythms often do not. There's no general rule, however. Often the more freely improvisational the rhythm, the more that it can breathe, the more we can play together, the more potential that a groove can emerge. The daily rhythms of control societies can be debilitating, as we all know. Grooves, however, don't just rehabilitate rhythms, they exhilarate them in that they create something new at a higher intensity. So, what are rhythms? Rhythms are distributions of singular and ordinary points in an encounter. They are an encounter's temporal dynamics, its distinctive, repetitive emphases. The ordinary points of a rhythm, as Toulouse says, are unremarkable, the same, the past. What matters is the distribution of singularities. These are intensive differences, accents, attacks, punches. They can also be silent and dead points, anything. Um, 
that syncopate the encounter in unique ways. Rhythmic singularities, as anyone who has danced to play music with others can attest, are embodied forces. They create a new kinesthetic, and in that sense, they are immediately effective. What accounts for this creation and distribution of singularities? What actualizes the groove? This is the function of the caesura. The caesura is our clue to the production of an encounter that persists. The caesura marks the onset of a groove. The break happens when you least expect it, but in one sense it's always there because it is time passing itself. It's a cut in the rhythm, an arrhythmic event that initiates a new state of intensity. The caesura is a break in the repetition of equalities. Tradition defines it as a break in a line that is not counted. It's a common device in music and poetry where it's used as silence, as breath, to increase the dynamic impact of a sound or a word line. But really, it is relevant to any kind of rhythmic encounter, including social encounters of all kinds. The claim that a caesura is not counted is very misleading. Deleuze again says, time is in order. Time passes not as a count, like a metronome, but as intensive becoming, intensive differentiation. In anti-Oedipus, Deleuze and Vatry note that intensive differences are differences not of degree, but of nature. A cardinal division of time, as opposed to an ordinal division, Time. The cardinal division of time as a whole would result in an equally infinite past and future. But an ordinal division is never a, uh, about equality, uh, but rather marks the unequal intensive nature of time. This is why the division performed by a caesura is never exact in terms of what length it has, where to place it, and so on. But a caesura is nevertheless still precise. Precision, to draw on Sun Ra, is a matter of achieving a new power of time, not an optimum extension or length of time. The break in time is anexact, as opposed to inexact or non-exact. Precision is a matter of power, not extension. Caesuras are said to introduce a natural feeling into rhythm where natural is sometimes completed with human or non-mechanical. The assumption is that because caesuras are breaks of inexact length, they make rhythms less metronomic. But there is nothing really human or natural about a caesura. Anything can break a line of time. A noise, a color, a stutter, a flash of thought, a disaster, a comet striking the earth the sun exploding. The caesura is symbolic of the whole of time. It is an imminent break in the intensive inequality of time, a break necessary for time to pass. The most important uh, feature of this break is its passive nature. It is this passive quality of the caesura in the generation of a group that we must understand before inquiring into its human or natural qualities. The traditional definition of the caesura still assumes activity. That is, it begins with conscious, attentive awareness rather than the creation of that awareness. As passive force, the caesura produces sensations. It demands attention, like the child running across the room. It is the gap between inhalation and exhalation the instant of actualization of a potential, a shift from the inside to the outside. We can translate this experience in terms of an ethics of encounters and what bodies can do, because bodies are just rhythmic distributions of intensive forces. A powerful encounter has a rhythm that increases our, uh, the capacity of a collective force to affect and be affected 
to increase the collective's power of existence and action. So from here on, we'll speak of this intensive temporal and collectively embodied sense of the Caesura and what it means for encounters. For that, however, we need an intensive definition of time, which Deleuze provides, and which I'll just say a couple of words about here. Deleuze's theory of passive temporal synthesis is found in difference and repetition with variations in logic of sense, anti oedipus Proust, and signs. The first passive synthesis, the present, founds time. The second, the pure past, grounds it. And the third, the future, ungrounds the ground and allows a new time to arise. In the order of conditions, the first synthesis, the present, is originary. But if you reverse this, in the order of synthesis, the future is primary in the order of the genesis of time. The third synthesis, performed by the Caesura, breaks the present from the past and synthesizes the unequal past and future to make the present passes new and not merely a doubling of the past from their repetition of the past. The Caesura lies between the rise and fall of the event. It constitutes the event's unity as difference, whose distribution constitutes uh, the rhythm of the events. The caesura is not a phase or a specific duration, but a threshold between phases. Therein lies the event's highs and lows, its prominences and troughs. It is the moment of metamorphosis, when potential becomes actual. It looks both ways within the event that it creates. That which is only potential in the future and has become actual in the past, but must in the caesura become both at once. The new arises in the caesura, which then, like the break between rhythmic feet from which the term originates, draws together potential and actualized in their difference. The caesura acting as the condition of real affective experience, a condition of the new. The potentialities consist in prom to come, the potentialities to come consist in prominences, remarkable points, which are problematic and indeterminate with respect to whether they will come to be actualized. Rhythms here are ways uh, purely temporal intervals become grouped together by distributing accented and unaccented moments, independent of any standardized periodicity. The caesura is the onset of intensive fluctuations. It is a kind of arrhythmia an uneven, fluctuating pressure that forces time to pass. It is spontaneous and ungrounded. In other words, it is time itself and events in themselves. Time out of joint. It actualizes proto-rhythmic potentials and changes the dynamic. Caesura's prepare rhythms. They mark the non-ground from which rhythms emerge. They are the paradoxical syntheses of potential and actual times. The caesura is the glitch, the stutter, that makes time pass, creates passive rhythms, actualizes capacities to affect and be affected, and in that deeper sense adds to our joy and sadness. I'll sum up. Here we return to the ethical problem of the caesura in the encounter. What creates a powerful, persistent encounter? In any collective activity, certain of its own expressive elements will cut into and draw together the assemblage as a whole, creating temporal series that constitute a new distinctive rhythm. In collectively improvised music, for example, an errant sound will suddenly assert itself to pull the ensemble in its direction. The ensemble will lock in on this element and change to follow the emerging sound. We have called this the onset of the groove. There is a feeling of rhythmic propulsion, a stronger sense of cohesiveness, a heightened sense of awareness of the totality of the ensemble and its power. What are these events? First, they are singular. Second, they are non-formulaic. Third, even though they are non-formulaic, they are nonetheless precise events. They couldn't have happened at a different time.
And lastly, although they are singular, they share a common horizon outside the control rhythm of the ongoing activity, the past, and actualize a potential as a new rhythmic creation. The caesura, then, is a figure adequate to time as a whole. In that sense, the passing time of the encounter, the present, is the caesura, the glitch, that is, the encounter is ever new, ever restarting, the genesis of new rhythms, the present as glitch, as effective change. It is how an encounter persists, it is the whole of the encounter. There is an ethics of the encounter as caesura here. It's not about knowing where to place it. It's not about knowing how long the caesura lasts. The ethical problem lies in following it, in following uh, the potential to create something new in an encounter that persists. Again, the break can be anything. A noise, a cry, a silence, a laugh, a wink, an explosion, a disconnect, a rhythmic crash, a comet striking the earth. These are what create the sensation and the sense of the encounter. Caesars are things that draw us in, 